Hello, everyone. We'll uh, give it just a couple of moments to let everybody arrive. But today, uh, for this month's webinar from IOTSF, we're going to be talking about smart built environments, uh, cybersecurity for facilities professionals. So this is on the premise of what could be more important than securing our buildings against cyber attacks if our systems and the technology falls down. I'm delighted to welcome two absolute authorities on the subject. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Saab Sembi first. He is co-chair of the Smart Built Environment Working Group and the IOTSF Executive Steering Board. Saab is the CTO for Virtually Informed and had several CISO roles. He speaks, writes, and contributes to many events and publications. He was shortlisted for the CSO 30 2021 awards and was shortlisted uh, five in the IFSEC Global 2020 Most Influential People in Security. Saab is a mentor for startups and a board advisor, as well as co-chair of the Smart Built Environment Group and Executive Steering Board member for the IOTSF. So the second speaker that we're going to be hearing from today is James Willison. He is co-chair of the Smart Built Environment Working Group. In March 2022, James Willison joined IOTSF as project and engagement manager and is co-chair of the IOTSF Smart Built Environment Working Group. He's campaigned for over 20 years to bring cyber and physical security realms closer together. He works with Saab on IFSEC Converged Security Center and on smart city white papers. He's been an advisor on convergence to MITE uh, TSM board, uh, senior lecturer in security management at Loughborough University and a digital security expert with the European Union. He is also a volunteer leader with ASIS, um, a, actually, it should be pronounced ASIS, forgive me, uh, International on Enterprise Security Risk Management. So those are the two speakers that we're going to be hearing from today about smart built environment cybersecurity for facilities professionals. So I will hand over now to the first speaker today, which is James Willison. James, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. And it's a great pleasure, really, to be here. It's a fantastic day for us. It's three years we've been waiting. We never thought it was going to happen, but here we are. We're, we're presenting a document, which is absolutely brilliant. And um, so but we're all very excited about it. And I think I've got to give all due credit to so many people who've been involved in the process. But before I do, I want to share some slides with you and uh, hope that this will be helpful to give you an insight into what we've been doing over the last three years, because I can tell you it's been involving a great amount of people. And um, so here we go. Um, we'll, we're keen to um, involve uh, the project. So I'm going to share the screen now and move, move up a bit you don't mind. So very kindly, Chris has introduced both Saab and I, and that's a, a slide showing you that's who we are. That's we, We've been, been involved in leading a team of 20 plus people over the last three years within a context of about 50 others who have been involved. So it really is a lot of people being uh, contributing to this, and I'm going to show you what, what I mean by that. Uh, the new best practice guide from the IoT Security Foundation. And this slide is saying, well, here we are, we've made it. And this is important because if you've got any time, you can actually, if you've got a pretty good camera, that's a QR code there. And you can see the document, the best practice um, guidance uh, in link there. So uh, we're quite keen that you go to that link, uh, read the document and it's 50 plus pages. It's uh, quite, it flows well, we think now, and um, I hope you enjoy it. So the next slide is, well, who was involved? And I think I wanna call out credit to all these people because without any of them, it wouldn't be what, what it is now. 
So first of all, Saab, I think, is the lead, one of the leading authors of the document, and a lot of his thoughts and processes and, uh, and insights have gone into this. And so we great, really are thankful as a foundation to him. And I know he's enjoyed doing it, and he'll tell us more <laughs> later, of course. Um, and then there's me. <laughs> Uh, moving swiftly on to the the, the, key, the group leader. Of, so what happened is a, a general context. Uh, I'll, I'll go into some bit more detail in a minute because I think it's worth pursuing. Um, but Dave Cook, who sadly can't be on the call today, uh, he, he is a representative from the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management. And um, again, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, Rich, the, the key editors of which there have been quite a few over the last three years, um, starting with Jason, did a lot of work and carried on doing work. So thank you to Jason, who's done a lot of editing over the period of time. So we had at one time 120 pages or so. And with Jason's help and others, we've we've got a bit shorter. Then uh, John Moore, our illustrious managing director, came in and really helped us out on the editing side and, and focused our attention on various aspects that he thought was were, were important and sort of re, restructured the introduction a bit. And um, so thank you to John. And then, uh, of course, uh, Richard Marshall has been really significant in editing the document over the, over the years and especially in the last couple of months, but also in the process and the first year and in the second year. So as I said, it's a three year process. It doesn't hasn't just happened. Then, of course, I'm thanking the main contributors, Emma Bokes from the University of Portsmouth. Um, she did a lot of work on rewriting some of our, our words. Thank you to Emma and making it readable. And uh, the introduction and lots of other places. And she's really helped us. Dave Cook, as I said, has been very insightful because he's provided the facilities managers and professionals, as, as they're called, their perspective on um, the facility and what they need to understand and, and what, what is relevant and practical for them because a lot of these things are, are not in the scope or remit of most facilities professionals which is why we put this guidance together. It's not that we're trying to be smart and say oh we know everything but we're trying to share the best practice so this is a this is a point here it's a best practice guide it's not mandatory really we, there's, there's legislation is coming and there's some legislation you, on privacy, for example, which you could pull in. And I know some people might come up to me in question and say, well, what about this legislation and that legislation? I'm not saying there isn't anything, but, but particularly where we it's we found it difficult to mandate stuff. So and I think Saab will deal with that a bit more in, in the um, requirements part. So we've made it into a best practice guide, which which, you know, um, if you're really going to be effective in this, this this scenario, you've got to do that, um, even if it's not legal. Uh, so, but interestingly, on a side point, <laughs> um, the, the CISO in the US have made um, a security convergence. They say it's a must thing to do. And part of our uh, whole process and approach to this document is that it's a converged security approach. It's not any silos in there, it's collaborative and it's saying the facilities professional needs to collaborate with the cybersecurity and the person looking after the OT or whatever, whoever they are, there needs to be a collaborative approach. And that's the focal point of, of, all the, of all the content, every page, if it's not there blatantly, it's there subliminally. Um, so then I'm, I'm gonna move on to thanking Nikki, Dr. Nikki Gadaminia from the University of East London, at London on, on the, especially on the BIM aspects, the um, building information management um, aspects. She's fantastic on that and helpful on standards and all the standards uh, that there are around that issue. Um, we saw Jesus from uh, Aston University, again, on lots of some of the technical stuff on the control rooms and other as aspects of the, the building management systems. and some of the cybersecurity aspects that he he's understands and can advise us on. And of course, John Moore, again, um, I'm not forgetting John and his uh, overall perspective and, 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 and challenging us on various different aspects of what we've been doing. And then uh, Nick Morgan is a very experienced person in the field of uh, property management and advising C, uh, on cybersecurity and information security from Derwent London and a lot of content on privacy and uh, 
response and and how how do people really understand the risk and relate it to the, the building and uh property managers in there so we've had although we are expecting a, a building management uh group are also working and we're, we're encouraging people to join that group once this is published which is today so next next month we'll be starting that process with the building managers uh, Rajiv Riji, um, he's did a lot of technical advice and some of the content there in the technical aspects. He's uh, uh, contributing. And thank you to him for um, a lot of technical understanding, which a uh, few of us have got on that level. And then Saab, of course, um, throughout has made content and uh, adapted and edited and uh, challenged and said this is right or this is wrong and we should be really change this. And, and then of course added stuff um written stuff himself um jason i've mentioned and um and then finally uh, ian pointer uh, again with the, in the first couple of drafts we helped us to focus where we should be affording our attention and then mike on the ot fantastic advice on ot thank you mike on how, how how significant those systems are and they are part as we believe part of the whole connected systems with IoT that is part of the same. And we're, we are um, focusing on as many systems as we can. Whatever is connecting, that's what we believe we should be securing. So um, I'll go to the next slide. This is a quote which shows our alliance with the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management, because without them, that again, we, we wouldn't really know who, who our audience are. So we're very pleased that they are engaged with us and promoting what we're doing. And contributing to this document through Dave, who's leading the chair, and sadly can't be with us on the call today. On, so I would really have liked Dave to be here, but he couldn't. He had work commitments, couldn't, he couldn't. But he would otherwise have been here, you know, sort of steering the whole group. And so, in terms of really saying, well, what difference does it make to a facilities manager? You know, you can't a facilities professional. Um, so here we have the quote, and they're excited. They're, they they're promoting excellence in their contribution worldwide um so then we're going through um the knowledge that the industry coupled with the technical specialism of the itsf has proved a powerful alliance and we are grateful to the iwfm for that and their and their help so what so i've said um over the last three years special uh, the smart built environment working group has been actively involved in crafting and discussing this important guidance from a from both a strategic perspective, so the overall context which Saab will go into the governance and the risk and the compliance and, and you know who's responsible for what, and then passing it through to the people who are actually managing the technology, their technical perspective. We've had lots inside and just shared you those people are on the, in the document. They've, some of those people have got a lot of understanding of what the technical perspective is. And so that's in the document. Uh, so it's got, it's got some, say, practical hands-on stuff, which um, that's what I say there. So it's a hands-on approach. And it, what, what needs to be done to secure the smart build environment is vital. And this is what we're looking at. So it should be really helpful to you if you're in this environment, which I believe many people are. So there's a quote there. This is from the uh, introduction. The rapid expansion of digital technologies, including smart and connected devices, the risks associated with IoT are significant. The integration of these devices and systems into a building increases the attack surface, exposing them to potential threats from malicious actors. Well, none of this, this isn't a surprise to many people, but we need to say it, right? So the new guidance provides a comprehensive framework for managing cybersecurity risks and ensuring the safe operation of IoT systems, and as I said, any other systems connected to the building for that matter. Um, and so throughout building's life cycle. So it's from sort of design and uh, development through right through to decommissioning. So we do look at all different stages and uh, and handing over different systems as well when that happens with new new contracts and stuff. So um, now this is a general overview for um, a bit more detail. But the basically I'm I'm covering in this part of the, t of the webinar is the introduction and the uh, smart built uh, systems. I can't go into detail, but I welcome you to read it. <laughs> um, so the intended audience obviously is facilities professionals, uh, but not only them, but all the other people that they work with in securing a building. And if they don't understand how to secure a building, which is unlikely, they're going to go to, first of all, cybersecurity people and physical security people. So some of those people, as we know, the CISOs and the CSOs actually have got management responsibility 
for the CCTV systems. And some people think, well, that's not an IOC system. Well, funnily enough, it is, you know. So sometimes people on the learning curve, they don't realize what's an IoT device or system, what's anything really that's connected to the internet. And, um, and so most of the systems now, the new ones are. And um, so we look at the different systems. Um, then the evolution and the evolution of technology, which is uh, covered, we cover that. Uh, then smart building technologies and impacts and implications. So I'm going to look at two examples before handing over to Saab because I think it's important to get to the other things in the document before we have a general discussion. So um, there are two examples I wanted to look at that we do cover and that saying, well, okay, so what systems are you talking about in the building? And are they secure or, you know, who's looking after those? And what we say is that you should find out, well, basically make sure the person, you, that someone is responsible for all of those systems, find that person and talk to them, obviously, and then say, well, are you cyber secure or not? And if they don't know the answer, then say, well, we need to talk to you now, have a collaborative approach with everybody else who's, and the cars tables, which is the responsibility stuff. We work out who those people are going to be doing, what they're going to be doing and how they're going to make the building more secure. So this is one sort of building management system enables building operators and management companies um, to basically monitor and adjust the performance of building systems. These systems typically comprise of sensors, actuators, controllers, and workstations, which can be managed either locally or cloud-based solutions. And of course, the other problem we've got is remote access, which is a big problem. And uh, so with COVID and all the other things that we've had in the recent years, um, and that actually COVID was provided a benefit for us because we had we meet a lot, which we did, you know, um, over the years. Um, so we had got a lot of work done that way. But in historically, BMS systems were connected together via separate communication networks using either proprietary or open standard protocols and remained predominantly independent from other systems. But now, of course, things have changed, and it's like. Well, IOC doesn't matter, does it? Well, actually, yeah, it does coming through the back door. So back the back door of your building, or well, actually it's not really the back door, but it's everywhere in the building. So as clients and building owners are increasingly wanting smart, smarter buildings, manufacturers have responded to the development of sensors, devices, and controllers that provide superior control and functionality over the internet. Such connectivity has created opportunities to um, create smarter BMS through converging critical BMS information and remote access anywhere in the world. So that's the sort of really smarter stuff, you know, but most buildings as, as we are unfortunately are aware, they might not call those, they might not think of themselves as smart, but actually they are connected. So they've got the same problems, but they, they think they don't have, or they, they, they're not so worried. But fortunately over the years, so Saab and I've worked together and other people across the world, to raise the problems that there are in these situations. And then we see the, the Kaspersky's and the like of, who can show how we're gonna attack those, how they can be attacked. And there are, we, we quote some places where they've given reports. And then the last, before I hand back to Saad now, um, I want to look at merge access control because that's a clear example of how you can bring together all these different systems to uh, uh, you know manage access and Physical security and our digital identity have for many years been considered quite separately, but in a smart building, which may have numerous IoT devices and systems such as doors, cameras, and PCs, there's a need to manage access in a converged approach. Uh, this is especially true given the increase in home working and associated IoT devices with that. Um, the facilities team responsible for access control should collaborate and ensure that remote access is, cannot be compromised by physical access and vice versa. So you don't want someone who's logging into in a, in a, in a company in, in Berlin when actually they're walking through the front door in, in the UK in, in uh, your London offices. Who, who are you going to work out? Who's who? You've got a joined up approach, which means you can. So that's what you need to be doing. And, and some companies are doing it very well and others are not really understanding the risk. So I think that gives you a broad overview and we'll have a chance to discuss other things, obviously, after Saab's given his uh, introduction. James, I'll um, just mention before we, we go to Saab that um, if anybody's got any questions or comments, thoughts, whatever you like, um, use the chat facility. 
uh, on Zoom and we can ask those during the, the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Now, what's typical is that when we come to the Q&A section of the webinar, suddenly there's an influx of questions and we can't get through them all. So please be advised getting your question in as early as possible or your critique or comment, whatever. Um, if you can send it as early as possible, uh, I'd be very grateful. Uh, Sam, if you're ready, it is over to you. Great, thank you very much. Just very quickly, um, to give you an indication of how experienced the team is, I'm just going to mention my background and, and, and um, how I got into this. Although it's by accident, the team that have been involved in this ha ha haven't really got together by accident. I first looked into the vulnerabilities of network CCTV systems way back in about 2004. And I was amazed that when I looked at the vulnerabilities, at how there were so many vulnerabilities at each different layer. And I complained to the, uh, the manufacturers, I complained to the installers, I complained to those that who, who were procuring, and I couldn't make any changes on my own. Um, and then I met other people like James, like Paul. I know Paul is on the call, and, and, and thank you for joining us, Paul. Uh, but there's a whole team of people who've been at this and been thinking about this for many, many years. Uh, and I'm just trying to emphasize the point that this document that we have here today hasn't come around by chance, by accident, a few people getting together and said, you know what, let's just write a few words. It, it is something that has been distilled in about five different versions uh, over the last three years. And um, in, in, in terms of bringing that together, it's all of our experiences from a document which was over a hundred pages long and trying to distill all of that knowledge and that experience to try and uh, fit it into a document that we thought was actually going to be um, best used as best practices uh, for that particular target audience. So I just wanted to emphasize that first. How, with that said, let me get started on um, presenting and... Right, just about to share. There we go. You should be able to see the document requirements structure. Let me know if you if you can't. Good. I assume you can. Good. Excellent. Right. So um, this is the current structure, and it's changed a lot from uh, where we started. What I want to focus on is. Um, from uh, chapter three onwards, because that's that's a, a majority uh, of where I've been involved. And when we looked at this and we started pull things together, we felt that um, one of the key things that we needed to get right when we look at this topic is to make sure that the governance is right. And if the governance is right and we start from the top, we can make sure that each a layer that we go down um, that the right things are being done by the right people and, and, and we're working on, on, on those in the right way. So chapter 3.1 is, is around governance, risk and compliance to make sure that we are, we've set the right structure up to help support the things that we need happening further below. Uh, and, and that was a, a key thing and that's why that's at the top. Then in terms of some of the processes and risk responses, we started off and we thought, what we want to put a, 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 a head there is uh, three, two, one, which is IoT technology and security requirements. Really, what we wanted to make sure is that um, everything else, whatever else is there, may well be about getting the structure right, may well be about detection, it may well be about a whole range of other things. But the IoT device and system itself, we thought we'd include that and start that as the top. And then we started to break down the various phases within an organization um, that an organization would go through if it was going to implement any of the technologies that we're talking about um, within the, the facilities uh, domain. And most of those technologies are actually covered in chapter uh, two. Um, I'm not going into those. I know James didn't go into them, but they are fairly straightforward. If on the left hand side, as you can see, building an energy management, uh, safety and security systems, 
electronic security systems, merged access, vertical transport, automated parking, and control rooms. So all of those technologies uh, we are, are the sort of things where we're trying to cover the IoT security aspect in 3.2.2. Then as we move on across the supply chain, we've got design um, and procurement installation. Some of these things don't necessarily, uh, sorry, I should start going. Some of these things that we've put together aren't necessarily things that are dealt with the same teams, but we put them together because we wanted them to be dealt with together in terms of this document and trying to implement some of the best practices that we came up with. Equally, the installation commission acceptance, they are separate quite often, but we, we, we lump them together um, for the purpose of the document and operations, uh, maintenance and upgrade uh, as, as well. And then we included uh, next, those things that uh, in, in, in the NIST document, if anyone's uh, familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework, where there's five functions, the identify, the protect, uh, the, the detect, respond and recover. And we try to include those because we think they are key. Then once we get through those, where they're related, we've merged them with other processes. And towards the end, we uh, look at um, business continuity, recovery and resilience and decommissioning. And the last thing you see there on in chapter four is the cast tables, and I will cover the, that in a short while. Um, okay. Right, so in terms of examples of some of the best practices that we've included, um, we were aware that we should really be using terms like must, must not, required, shall, shall not, should, and so on, in accordance with the RFC um, 2119. However, we were also very aware when we were putting this together that as the first version, we were going to be flexible this time round and that we were not going to make everything mandatory um, and, and we only wanted to select a few things that we thought should be mandatory. So we were very wary that in this first edition, we didn't want to make too many things that were mandatory. We want to start off slowly and then uh, build on that as, as time goes on. So in terms of some of these requirements, this is an example of, a of one of the tables that we've got there. This is security governance requirements. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail. This is just supposed to be as an example. We have numbered them and we will stick to the same numbering that we've got here. If anything becomes out of scope for any reason in the future, uh, that number will still exist, but we will change the text of that as a requirement. But uh, it's uh, it, what we wanted to do was make sure that anyone that uses this, it's future-proofed because we are sticking to the same numbering in the same way as um, uh, uh, all the other uh, documents that we, that we do create in ITSF, especially, for example, like the assurance framework where, you know, once you've started to use it, you need to know what happens to it and, and what's going on with that particular document itself. Sorry, that requirement itself. Um, there are complete requirements um, and, and, and documents are available to anyone to download. Um, it, it is a starting point. It's not an ending point. That's very key uh, in, in our thinking in this document. Okay, so in terms of the CARS table I mentioned before we open this up to discussion, what we wanted to do was, this is what CARS stands for. It stands for Communicate, Approve, Responsible and Support. Um, many of you in the call may be familiar with the RACI table um, and, and, and using that matrix. The reason why we went for CARS is because we liked the S in terms of the support, because we felt that the target audience, one of the target audience, although it seems like the only one in the title, um, the, 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 the facilities uh, professionals, we want everyone that's involved in this to work as a team, as opposed to leave it all to the facilities professional or to the CISO or to any one group of people. The idea is there's lots of people involved lots of teams involved that they're coming and they, they, they are involved as, as necessary. And in many cases, they may well only be supporting and they won't, may not be responsible. Uh, they may not have 
there may be more than communication and they may be involved in approving. So what we wanted to do was bring in as many people as possible as we could to help support the facilities professional. And that's the reason we went for the cars table rather than the racking table. Um, now an example of the cars table we have included within the document itself um, is, is this one here on security governance. This gives you an idea um, clear business goals and priorities are set in relation to smart built environment, its assets and security, and that tells you in terms of um, who, we, who approves, who's responsible, uh, who supports, uh, and, and who's communicated and so on. And really, um, we, 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 we are going to expand this, um, and, and the expanded uh, tables that we have for cars are not in the current document. This is just one example we've included in, in that document that's, that's available. What we are doing is we're creating a whole range of tools that um, our IOTSF members who are uh, subscribers or member, full, full, full members, they can use and, and they will get access to. So they'll get access to all the other tools that we are going to be creating that help um, sort of take this document forward to the next level. That is my last slide. So I'm gonna to move to the questions and pass back to Chris, if that's okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Saab. Um, well, I've got a couple of questions of my own just to get things kicked off. I'll, I'll come back to you, James, I'll, I'll bring you in. Um, why should a CSO look at this? Okay. Well, yeah, great question. Why should a chief security officer, that could be mainly physical security, or it could include information security, depending on your definition of the CSO, of course. Um, whatever the person is looking after, however big the organization is, that many of those people, male, female, you know, whoever, are responsible for those systems. Now, sometimes they think, we've looked at surveys and things, but they think, oh, well, the, because it's sort of cybersecurity attacks on a physical type system, a CCTV system, I don't have to worry really because you know they're they're looking after it for me and 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 some of them might be actually you know because they've they've worked out that actually oh that's a bit that shouldn't be on the network <laughs> or it's we've got to look after it and so that, I mean there's some good people out there doing that so don't get me wrong but then then the other team thinking well no that's a physical security group that's their responsibility they bought the system they developed it designed helped work with the designers and installers on there and. Um, and sometimes the, the issue isn't really looked at very well. And um, that's what we're worried about. So that part of the reason is the CSO possibly has got responsibility for this um, <clears throat> or, or somebody else. But the point of our document is to say, in your organization, what are you doing about the security of the CCT system or the access control system or both? And how are you monitoring it? And, and how do you know where the attacks are coming? What sort of technology are you using or software are you using to monitor it even? So, okay, you might have sort of put in some basic cybersecurity hygiene and, and good for you if you have, or you're working with a good manufacturer or supplier who's who's done a good job on that. But what about the day-to-day -day running of the system? Is it being patched and monitored, upgraded uh, in a cyber secure way? Well, I wonder. Um, and that means, therefore, you should be looking at it as a CSO, since you're probably the top person responsible, and the facilities professional might up be coming to you to say, what are you doing about this? Um, so you've got to have an answer for them, if, if you're reporting into them or whoever you're reporting to, really. Thank you, James. Um, if you'll indulge me with one other question that I've got written down. Um, this document, why, why is this important to a, to a smart city project? Okay, well, yeah, there are now millions of smart building projects or smart and part of smart city projects. And you could argue that any building is connected to another building, potentially will be in the future. So the more we connect, the more of an issue it's going to become. And if smart cities continue to be built or whatever you want to call them, sustainable cities or safe cities or whatever it is, they, they are more and more connecting different things. And so our building, which we might be local, but we are we could be connecting to other systems outside, you know, like the cars coming in, 
the, the transport system within the building might be linked into the vehicle that's been downloading some some patch from something else and then are they sure are you sure that that where your data is in the vehicle where is it where, where has it gone to you know is it coming to the building even and what is it interfering with anyone else's smart system in the building or if, if you lock down if you segmented it off so that it doesn't or is there any kind of routing security involved in the hub of the car or what what you know so you've got to look at all these different connections and is the data being passed through anywhere so whatever the system is to connecting it to other systems within within that smart city environment and then you've got the privacy concerns as well so some people so protest about their privacy being not regarded and then projects being built or buildings being built and then lo and behold, the citizens just around the corner so are managing to succeed in stopping them. Well, they did in Canada. I think that's been changed now, the Toronto uh, issue. They they did succeed in stopping a big project being built in Toronto. Um, but I think that's been resolved. But, you know, you have to work with uh, the people in the community. And we've got questions flowing in nicely um, on the zoom chat facility if you're watching today's webinar on a desktop if you just wiggle your mouse uh you'll see the the chat facility and you can ask your your own question or uh add your comments on, on thoughts etc um i'm going to abuse my position as the webinar host today um with just a couple more questions i've got two for you so um what are the top three benefits in using these requirements as a starting point in implementing iot cybersecurity in the smart built environment um, as I was hinting earlier on, many things should start with governance. And I think there are many, many professionals out there that try to do their best and, and a good job. And without the support at the higher levels with that governance, they're on their own struggling. And what this does is it helps people like that by, by going up to senior management, going up to some of the other teams that may well be involved in security, but not necessarily working with them yet. And it means that they can go and say, look, this is a document, this is best practice. Could we work with yourselves? Can we set up the right governance structure? And that way they've got a slightly better chance of, of succeeding. We've seen in the past many examples where um, hardworking professionals are, 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 who, who operate things on a day-to-day -day basis end up in a situation where they might get this bit right, but they get that bit, they can't get that bit right. Uh, they, they might get those three, four things right, but they can't get those other things right. And, and so we've tried to follow through um, logically all the different areas that may well need to be involved. And in terms of uh, three benefits, for example, I would say good governance helps to support everyone. Good governance helps support um, the, the, the budgets that you will need and differentiate the roles and who's going to be responsible to get things done, which quite often isn't clear. Uh, and the third benefit I would say is that the, the team that quite often um, is, is, is blameless in so many things, but in my view, not that they're to be blamed, but they hold so much power that, that we need to get right in the right way is the procurement team, for example. And if the procurement team have been given the right guidance and they've been given the right authority to actually be um, placing orders for those things that are secure rather than those things that are the cheapest to purchase, that says a lot. And, and, and I'd say those three are, are, are fairly straightforward benefits just by using uh, this guidance. Thank you, sir. Um, so one more question from me before I, I go to the, the questions that we've got in the chat facility. Uh, Saab, what are the top three challenges that people will come up against in implementing these requirements? Um, the first one is uh, trying to find uh, the right support, um, because all of these roles that we're talking about and all these different people that are involved in security, traditionally, in many organisations, um, if, if the organization's been around a, a long enough, the chances are there have been some 
uh, sort of siloed working over all that period of time. So I think the first thing is, is to start looking at how you can break down those silos and you can start getting support from a variety of different things. So that, that silo breaking is the first challenge that they'll have. Second challenge will be um, it, it, the new way of working, which is looking at try, getting support from the various organizations, sorry, various teams within the organization, actually playing a supportive role rather than that siloed role. So there is that silo part of it to begin with, but then changing that role to actually supporting and saying, do you know what? We need to be working with you. We can help you with this. So if, for example, the facilities people going to the network people and saying, look, we, we want to put all these on. Can you show us what we need to be doing in terms of segmentation? Can you tell us we, what we need to be doing on this, on that? Then going to the procurement tip people and going to each of the teams in the right way and getting the right support and getting the right buy-in. Um, the third challenge, I think, is effectively all of this will point to so much that the organization hasn't been used to doing in the past and, and, and taking a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach both at the same time. And I think that 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 that, that is a massive challenge that, that people aren't used to because we are talking about um, different types of security and risk all coming together to try and look at something from a single view. Thank you very much, sir. Um, one more, uh, well, a couple more things just before we come to uh, the first set of questions on the chat facility. Just want to let everybody watching today know that the next webinar from us here at IOTSF is going to be on Thursday, the 27th of April. And the topic is going to be Europe uh, the European Cyber Resilience Act, or CRA for short. Um, and that's uh, one of our confirmed speakers. Uh, for the next webinar is Florian Lukavsky. So looking forward very much uh, to welcoming Florian next month. That's April the 27th. It's, these webinars are always on the, the final Thursday uh, of every month. I'm going to give a special mention to my colleague or, well, I'm sad to say former colleague now, Jenny Devoy. Um, it's, it's public knowledge that Jenny has uh, now left IoT uh, Security Foundation for Pastures News. So today is actually the, the first webinar we've done without Jenny's support. She's been absolutely fantastic, beavering away in the background, just making sure that these webinars um, have been running smoothly and just helping with the, the basically holding my hand um, and doing a lot of the work um, that does go into the prep for these webinars. So I'd like to wish Jenny all the best uh, and good luck for the future. I know a lot of people watching today are familiar with Jenny. Um, she's very much a familiar face um, within the fraternity, if you like, of IOTSF. So all the best to you, Jenny. So first question, this is from Lewis. Uh, Sab and James, how do you see signing capabilities for the B stroke EMS by remote maintenance engineers developing in the future? This is assuming that there are potential attacks via this route. James, I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to I go first on this. Oh, you want me to go first? <laughs> um, well, I think, to be fair, um, there are issues with remote access to any of these systems. And that, as we've found out with the many secured projects, which I can refer to, that's what we're most concerned about with the router is how you know, in a system which there will be routers and gateways in these systems and device, uh, connecting these devices actually, of course. Um, and that's a prime target. And therefore 75%, as we know, of the attacks are focused on that. And if they can be attacked and compromised, that does mean that a lot of these, well, even, you know, the evil light bulb scenario can be an issue of concern. And, you know, if the lights of building are compromised, that could be majorly catastrophic, but even worse if it's a, you know, air conditioning and uh, other things can really be quite devastating if it's a, you know, biological weapon. And I think there are, we have to be prepared for those sort of scenarios where buildings need to be locked down as much as possible against, you know, infiltration of, of uh, you know, so we've got to be defending. Uh, so, but I think Saab might know more about the more technical aspects of this. So I'll ask him to 
Um, just to add to that then, um, the issue of remote access uh, is, is something that the joint group um, are, are on behalf of the ITSF, I sit on a group with um, the British Security Industry Association, it's called CISBAG, uh, fondly enough, um, it, it's, it's, it's looking at cyber security of, of these different technologies. And, and the group consists of um, uh, various um, governance organizations uh, and, or regulators and uh, of, of end user organizations and they are all installers and they came up with a code of practice um, which is if I remember correctly it's in its third iteration and that and I've been involved in two iterations I think it is um, and what they understood and realized was that quite often when we come to remote access, it's something that installers, when they install, if they don't know what they're doing around network security, are going to make mistakes. And the code of practice actually tells them that really, um, on their part, unless there are good reasons, and those good reasons that there's a business case, and that they know who's doing it, how they're doing it, and a whole range of things, if they're not doing it properly, remote access is actually a bad thing to allow um, and that they need to turn it off if they can turn it off, if that's the option. And, and we're not, then they need to seek advice with the right people in terms of the organisation as how the organisation wants to manage it because it is a vulnerable area. Thank you very much, Saab. Um, and thanks for the, the question, Lewis. Uh, next question um, is from, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Simone, Simone Casadillo. Yes, poorly secured remote access is definitely, well, this is more of a, of a comment I should clarify, but if, if you gentlemen uh, want, to, want to give your take on it. Yes, poorly secured remote access is definitely a possible attack vector. Example, target breach of 2013. Okay. Well, I think Hugh's answer to that. Well, thank you, Sir Hugh, for answering that one. I'm um, in the yeah. chat. There. It's not really a very good example because it was an attack on enterprise systems via the supplier portal. Um, um, again, I'm hoping I'm. Um, oh, sorry, James, you had more. Yeah. Um, so I'm just reading his answer to that because I think it's probably the best answer. Um, Hugh's saying target stores is not a good example regarding security of building systems. It was an attack on enterprise. Enterprise systems via the supplier portal, allegedly using stolen. Can't read the rest of it. Uh, yeah, so I, so I support that. Basically, um, again, I'm answer, hoping. Sorry, uh, Chris, the sorry. answer's in the chat. Um, it's in the chat box. Yes, sorry, Chris. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. So I'm, the question. <laughs> I'm further up the chat than, than you, yes. you guys are, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to answer. Um, but for, for the benefit of, um, we, we, we should be mindful that this is all being recorded for anybody yes, that can't be watching yeah. it live. So, and they're not going to have but I'll read. I'll, I'll read Hugh's answer since Hugh's a leading expert on this area. Target sure. stores is, is not a good example regarding security of building systems. It was an attack on enterprise systems by the supplier portal um allegedly using stolen credentials from the hvax maintenance supplier there there are currently few if any good examples of attacks on backs okay okay um, i've just reminded myself that indeed today's webinar is being recorded uh recorded as has uh, our previous two webinars in january we had a, a dual topic of uh, PSCI, uh, the UK PSCI Act, and also vulnerability disclosure. Last month in February, that was all about SBOM. Uh, IOCSF members can view both of those webinars. Uh, if you go via Basecamp, um, then you'll be able to, to find those uh, two uh, recordings of previous webinars. If you don't have your Basecamp details, do get in touch with us. Uh, and we can source out your, your login credentials. And of course, today's webinar will be added to the, the previous two um, in case you want to watch it back or maybe you came in um, a little bit late or whatever. Uh, it will be available 
to IOTSF members. Um, again, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this name correctly. I think it's Weiser Jesus. Uh, the comment is, or simply lack of network segmentation in the case of targets, all too preventable, says Captain Hindsight, that is. Go to Durgesh. Are there any case studies where this progress uh, process, excuse me, has been used? Uh, so, um, no, because this is a new area uh, that we're bringing in. Because if you look at pure cybersecurity, and I mentioned the five functions that the NIST cybersecurity framework includes, that they that's the approach taken by cyber people. What we're trying to do here is bring in some of the other processes um, that, that include the selection of and design of um, technologies, which you don't often get in detail uh, within the, 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 the NIST cybersecurity frameworks so much. And also the fact that the, these other processes play a different role within physical security systems compared to other systems. And we, we chose this approach specifically uh, there is none uh, no other case study at, as far as I know there may well be but none, none that I know of and we took this approach because we wanted to make sure that we were including things that both physical and cyber security uh, professionals would be familiar with uh, on, 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 on a regular basis. Um, I mean, that's it. We are sorry. We, we are aware that there will be organisations, quite illustrious ones, who are actually doing stuff in this field. But if they could con uh, get in contact with us, we'd love to hear from them. I mean, I could mention large company names in in facilities area who are looking at this particular situation. I don't need to name them, but we'd very much welcome any anyone who can get in contact and, and, and join our working group because that's the other thing we we would like some help because this is we, we produce this guidance and it's it's all very good stuff we believe mm -hmm. but we're looking for people who actually are working in the facilities arena who are in who are they can they they believe and i think there are companies <laughs> who are doing it in in one on one level we'd welcome their support if they could get in contact Thank you very much for your question, Durgesh. I'm hoping that's Durgesh in uh, Houston, Texas. If it is, good to have you along, my friend. Um, now, this next name uh, I do recognise because he is uh, quite a heavyweight uh, in the in the world of IoT security. This is from Mike Gibbs. Will you be developing a maturity model for this approach? <laughs> um, that's a brilliant question. So I'll go first because. I think Mike's alluding partly. We've got um, ASIS has developed an enterprise security risk management maturity model, which I believe personally, this particular document fits in very nicely to because it's part of an enterprise security risk management approach. So anything that all the things that we're saying in this document fit within an enterprise security risk management maturity model, um, which we spent a few years developing and is available also with ASIS, ASIS and there will be hopefully some friends on the call who will be familiar with that but this certainly this work that we're doing uh, would complement it and be part of that even I'm not saying we can't do our own model for this either that um, okay. just to comment on that you Yes, uh, I, I, uh, if, if you look at uh, existing uh, documentation from IOTSF, like the assurance framework, uh, there are maturity levels. Uh, effectively, at some point, we will look at that, and it is very important to do. So, Mike, great question, and uh, we hope to introduce them at the right time, in the right way. Uh, for the moment, what we were trying to do was to get something out there in the absence of nothing else being out there. Yeah. And we'll be developing tools to. So part of the framework of this, the requirements are going to be put into tools so that you can download them. But that's mainly for members to, to, to as a benefit to them. But you can you can certainly take the, the requirements yourself and work with it. But the point of obviously joining the foundation, which we, we encourage you to do, is that you get to join a large group 
that worked on this already and the experience and uh, understanding they have, which frankly speaking, you can't get from just even your best friend. Right? I could chat with Saab about it, fantastic, but the, the wider group, you know, has so many other con contributions. That's one of the valid benefits of being in, in our foundation. And we'd encourage you to, mm -hmm. to think about, you know, once you think about, well, how, okay, I've got all these requirements here, it's 150. Uh, some of them you can do, but some of them I don't think you can without some help. Um, if anybody would like to join um, the Smart Built Environment Working Group, it's uh, there on Basecamp, as are uh, all of IOCSF's working groups. So if you don't have your Basecamp login credentials, do get in touch with us uh, and we can take it from there and we can sort you out with that. Um, gentlemen, we are five minutes away from the end of today's webinar, so let's try and whistle through uh, a few more questions. Uh, this is from Hugh B., how do the authors propose tackling the issue of software bill of materials, otherwise known as SBOM, for modern BACs that often include significant cloud-based elements? Um, the first thing I'd say is that last month, uh, the IITSF produced a great document on SBOMs. So th th we we've got to start from there. Uh, secondly, I would say, that when it comes to uh, the, sorry, SBOMS is, is the abbreviation for Security Bill of Materials. Um, sorry to be sort of throw, throw jargon in, but yeah. Uh, and, and that is an excellent document. That's a starting point. Uh, and within this document, there were so many other things that we wanted to cover that um, although there is a mention, if I remember correctly, we did keep that in of, of, of SBOMS, um, it's not a key aspect of what we're looking at within this document. Um, and it, 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 in many respects, when we first started looking at requirements, my comment to James was, James, the problem with looking at requirements is, where do you start? That's the first problem. The second problem is, where do you stop? And, um, and, and, and we were very conscious of the fact that there are so many things that we could have included in the current version, but we wanted to leave it for future versions. So we don't go into SBOMs in a great way within this document. I don't know if you want to add to that, James, but that was intentional. Well, uh, yes, and it's a great question, of course, and very relevant. And um, in fact, that could be in version two. We, we're, 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 as Saab said, we're, we're trying to develop this. And I think there are aspects and the requirements, you know, if you fulfill all of those, I think you'd be doing a pretty good job. And that'll be part of your way to, to getting a software bill of material anyway. But we will certainly look at it in, in the depth that it's required um, in the next version, which is why we need we need more people to come and help us with, just, with that. Just a comment on that. Earlier on, I mentioned my interest in the vulnerabilities of network CCTVs way back in 2004. Um, and, and really, at that time when I was researching, I came across around about 250 versions of embedded Linux and over 250 uh, versions of uh, embedded web servers and, and all the different components that go into a network device, the protocols, the services, all of these things. And you know what? Things like the embedded Linux, things like embedded web servers, some of these were developed at that time by master students as a proof of concept, not expecting that anyone would ever use them in production. So the point that's being raised, I'm fully aware of it, fully understand it, um, and, and I fully support it. But in terms of this document, it's a, a way off before we can start including things like that, because partly, not entirely, partly it's covered within the document that came out last month. Time is up, I'm afraid. Um, sorry that we, I couldn't get through the rest of the questions that are in the chat facility. I know that the, the longer that the webinar goes on, the more thoughts people have, et cetera. So my sincere apologies um, if you couldn't get your question in. I suppose the, the debate could continue um, over on the Smart Built Environment Working Group on, on Basecamp, which I mentioned a couple of times, if you'd like to, to get into uh, the nitty gritty a little bit more. So as I mentioned previously, the next webinar uh, is going to be on April the 27th. It's always on the final Thursday 
of every month, and the topic is European, uh, the European Cyber Resilience Act, uh, and the first confirmed speaker for that is going to be Florian Lukowski. Saab, uh, you're in Slough beside Heathrow Airport, I think. Uh, James, you're, you're uh, remote working in uh, Bonnie, Scotland, as well as me. You're through in Edinburgh, and I'm just down the road from you. Whichever corner of the globe you've been watching from today, thank you very much. If you're not an IOTSF member, um, it would be fantastic to, to have you along. Just go to iotsecurityfoundation.org and you'll see details of how to join as well as how to view the fantastic Smart Built Environment document that we've been uh, indulging in today. Um, so until next month, uh, from Saab, from James and from myself and everybody that's been working in the background, thank you very much to uh, my colleagues um, namely uh, Angela Tanzi uh, and Grant Rollo. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again next month. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.